the movie. But chapter six is called Application of Inspiration. So there's a whole lot of stuff in here. Uh, the first couple sections deal with vectors, and then we get into some other type of application of inspiration called polar coordinates. And then we end the chapter with the complex, the trig form of a complex number. Um, and so those are kind of the three big ideas. <laughs> the three big ideas of this chapter. So um, there are lots of types of vectors. You could actually have like n dimensional vectors. It's kind of weird to think about that. Um, most of us don't think past three dimensional, but you could actually have like um, you know twelve dimensional vectors. Isn't that crazy? Uh, but we're only going to deal with two-dimensional vectors and talk about what operations can we do with vectors, how do we find unit vectors, and then tomorrow we'll get into more of the applications. If you're taking physics, then you've probably already done some of these problems, or if you're going to take physics, uh, why do we learn this? Uh, when am I ever going to use trig in a problem? If you do something with physics, um, then you, you use trig in, uh, in problems like this. So. Calculating the effect of the wind on an airplane's path. Someone gotta do it. So, if yesterday we talked about this. Um, if you watch the movie Despicable Me, the bad guy in the movie is named Vector, and he says he's named Vector because um, a vector has both lateral direction and magnitude. Direction and magnitude. Yes. Um, a, a, another way to say that is it's a directed line segment. I like your book. I'm going to get here to read your book before I read it to you. Uh, it says some quantities like temperature, distance, height, and area can be represented by a single real number. So like you could make a graph and you could, you could chart the temperature over time. So we can make a bunch of dots and each dot would represent the temperature at a certain time of the day. But there are certain quantities that a single dot doesn't represent it. Um, like velocity, acceleration, um, force, uh, those kind of uh, quantities need magnitude or length, um, and they need a direction. And so that's the difference between a dot and a vector. A vector is just a directed line segment, uh, a line segment with um, a length, right? And uh, pointing in a certain direction. If it was over here, then the direction would be going that way. Right? It's more like a ray, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not like it's a directed line segment. That's what it's called. Has direction. And direction. Yes. And. <laughs>
dimensional vector. Is that too bad I didn't make you write this whole paragraph? I would have written that. Uh, I know. It's an ordered pair of real numbers denoted in component form. All right? So sometimes the directions are going to say find the component or put in component form. And component form kind of looks like ordered pair, but instead of parentheses, we use those little um, I don't know, arrow segment things. We just wrote this in my class last night for something, well, something totally different. Um, but uh, he called it, I forget what he called it, but he actually gave it to me today. Um, pointed parentheses, that's what I think we should call them. Um, the numbers A and B are the components of the vector. The standard representation of the vector is the arrow from the origin to the point AB. The magnitude. Magnitude is definitely a vocab word you need to know because it just means find the length. The magnitude of B is the length of the arrow and the direction is the direction? That makes no sense. That makes sense. And the direction is the direction. <laughs> for magnitude, we just say length, we say magnitude, but for direction, we just say direction. So, um, The vector zero has the point zero, zero, the component zero, zero is magically called the zero vector because it has zero length and no direction. Um, your book sometimes uses it, sometimes doesn't. Most of the time when you're labeling a vector, you put an arrow above it. Right? So if I said the zero vector, I would say zero with a little ray above it, um, and I know that I mean the zero vector. If I'm talking about vector V, I would put, I mean, it looks like it says the arrow, but I would put an arrow of it, above it. So sometimes they do that, sometimes they don't. Um, but it just depends on, they kind of just write it as a bold letter. Um, so see how zero is bolded? So I think if you, if you have it bold, you don't have to have the line above it. But if it's not bold, then you'll put the line above it. So sometimes I'll put the line, and sometimes I'll forget, and I won't put the line. Yeah, that's okay. All right, look at these lovely vectors. What do you think uh, the initial point of the vector means? Where it starts. Where it starts, right? Um, can we write that down? Do we need to write that down? Well, I just label this as initial point. What do you think terminal point means? Where it is. And yes, the arrow on it. Um, is different than an arrow on a line, because an arrow on a line implies that it's going on forever. The arrow on this is just giving us the direction, but there's a point here, so we know at 3, 4, the length of that uh, vector stops. So that would be the terminal point. So it said in the last definition that the standard representation of a vector is from the origin to wherever it stops. Like this. This would be like the standard representation. But really, vectors can be anywhere. Um, so I just want to point out that equivalent vectors, if they have the same magnitude and they're pointing in the same direction, you agree that they should be equal to each other? Does that make sense that they would be equal to each other? Your book says any two vectors with the same length and pointing in the same direction represent the same vector. So vectors with the same direction and magnitude are equivalent. So looking at these two lovely vectors, do they look equivalent? They definitely look like they're pointing in the same direction. They look like they're the same length. They look parallel, so that looks like they're just going the same way, just in the same direction. How could we um, find their magnitude even? Yeah, back in a uh, good old geometry class, it's a distance formula, right? You can find the length of a segment. Do you remember the distance formula? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's Uh, 
You uh, subtract the x coordinates. And it really doesn't matter in what order because then you square them. So if you do x minus x1 plus x1 plus x2, as long as you square it, you're going to get negative 6. So. Plus. square missing off this. Um, if it's given to you in component form, then the magnitude um, is the square root of just the first component squared plus the second component squared. I don't know why the, the two didn't make the cut here. So some, some notation here. It looks like that says absolute value of V. That's the notation for magnitude. In my book that I'm using for my class and in the book that we use in Math 137, they use a double bracket for magnitude. So just so you're aware that different books different things. Uh, a lot of books use this notation because they don't want you to think absolute value. Yes, distance is always positive, but this book uses one, uh, one set of bars, but it just means uh, the magnitude. Um, something else to notice, uh, this book uses A and B for B. I'm not a big fan of it. I like to use B1 and B2, so just be aware that I might be using that as I go as well. But it just means you square the first one plus you square the second one. I didn't put a slide in here for this, but, oh my gosh. If they give it to you as point, and you want to go to component form, um, what's something called the head to tail something? No, tail to head. HMT, it says here, but <laughs> all right, I'm adding this. I don't know where you're going to put it. Head minus tail HMT. short. You can just fit it in like below the magnitude one probably. Yeah, I'll write um, it here for you. Head to show you. Using the same thing, if you have a vector represented by two points um, to go to component form, you know what you would do? You just subtract the, the the x's, so you do x2 minus x1, y2 minus y1. See, look, you can put that in there. That's why I didn't make a slide, because it's not that much to write. And then I would use another piece of paper on your notes. And basically, that's just kind of moving it as if it started at the origin. That's kind of what's happening. So let's find the magnitude of the ones on the previous slide. Um, I'm going to call the 
first one's OP because it started at zero, right? Not OP. It started at O and it ended at P. And when you do write that point, they do put the, the arrow above it. So what do you want to do? Do you want to do the point or do you want to change it to component one? Does it matter? Let's just do the points on this one and then we'll do the components on the next one. So this was the point, was it zero, zero, three, four? Is that right? Anybody have any clue what I'm saying? Yes, X is correct. You're way past that. So I'm going to subtract the X's. Three minus zero squared, subtract the Y, four minus zero squared, and I'm going to get nine plus 16, which is the square root of 25, which gives me a magnitude. I really should put the arrows or the lines around that. The magnitude of that vector is five. The length of that vector is five. And you could just do Pythagorean theorem there and say the horizontal component is three, the vertical component is four. That's where you get the five stuff. What about the other one? RS, I'm going to write it on here, but you can write it on the other one. What if I wanted to write RS in component form? In component form, I'm going to take x2 minus x1. So negative 1 minus negative 4 would make that 3. Yes? 6 minus 2 would make that 4. That's what component form is. Basically, is it's saying the distance, the length between those, the x's and the y's. So then if I wanted to find the magnitude in component form, I find it to be a little easier because you just are going to take the square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared, which is still going to be 5. For some of your homework today that says prove, show that uh, the vectors are equivalent, they want you to show that the magnitudes are the same. Don't say they look the same. Show it with the formula that they're the same. Okay? Questions about magnitude? Oh, look, you can do this one. And you can do it in uh, the easy addition formula, which probably makes the most sense since they give it to you as points. Or if you want to write it in component form and then take square root of the component and take the square root of it, that would work also. I did it both ways here to show you. The top one is just using the distance formula. Given two points, find the length of that segment. Um, so I just subtracted the x's and squared them, subtracted the y's. Again, because you're squaring it, it doesn't matter what order you do that in. Uh, because when you square it, it'll work out the same. And you should get, uh, that would be negative 2 squared, which is 4, plus negative 6 squared, which is 36, which gives me the square root of 40, which probably I could break up as two radical terms. Do I get the same thing in component form? Yes. So you don't have to do this both ways. I just want to show you both ways. Some of the ones on your homework, they give it to you as points. So it would make sense to probably use the top one. But if they gave it to you as component form, then it should be much simpler. Yeah. All right. So far so good. Yes? New, but not so bad. What else do we want to do? We want to be able to add and subtract vectors together. They call this the resultant. Instead of the sum, it's the resultant. Um, I want to draw a little picture on this, and I drew on my slide down here, so I want I think you should be able to do that. So let's draw a little uh, x y chart here. I'm going to draw the logo of these lines here. 
What if I had two vectors that started at the same point? So let's say I had, uh, like, starting here at zero. Let's say I had a vector u. Let's say u, u. And then starting here and going up like this, I had a vector v. I want to talk about what would happen if I added these together. Uh, and you don't have to do this geometric representation to do this every time, but I want to show you kind of where this comes from, uh, and then I'll just give you the formula, which you'll do. But if they start at the same point, when you add them together, uh, they call this the parallelogram rule, because we're going to make a little parallelogram. What if I uh, took this v and I put it over here, like took the same length of v and moved it over here? I wonder if I can cheat and do that. You think I can do that? So, you have to do the following. Length is the same, same length. Yes? What if I took u and then I cloned it and I made it up here to make a lovely little parallelogram? That's kind of cool. That's pretty cool, yeah? I try to do this in Math 27 by just drawing it and it never works out so I don't do that. I can cheat my way to that thing. It does because it's u and v. But here's what happens. If you add u plus v when they start at the same point, the resultant is the diagonal that comes from here. So if I drew in from here to here, that would be u plus v. And this point right here would be the terminal in there. And it would just be adding the first component of u with the first component of v, and adding the first or the second component of u with the second component of v. So this just becomes um, u1 plus v1, comma u2 plus v2, which means there's no need for you to write that or to draw the picture every time, because you just add the components together. It's pretty simple. But I wanted you to see kind of how that comes from. So we can say uh, the sum, or they use this, find the resultant of u plus v in component form is just going to be u1 plus v1 comma u2 plus v2. What if they didn't start at the same point? Let's draw another picture. Label this. Do you need to label this parallelogram, or do you think you'll remember? It's a parallelogram. What if I had a vector u, and I had another vector that um, starts where this one ends, right? V. That's what we call this one. tails to head, because this tail starts the new vector. What do you think? How do you think you're going to add those together, you know? From this initial point to this tail. Kind of makes a triangle with this. Would be Again, you do it the same way that you do up there as you add the components together. Um, that's just like the geometric reasoning behind it. So, um, there you go. Uh, also, we talked about the product of a scalar. What does that mean? Do you know? A scalar k is a vector u. Scalar multiple. I just mean the number, right? Like we're not multiplying two vectors together, we're just taking a number. So if this was v, what do you think 2v would look like? Yeah, like you just take 2 times the vector. So you would take that length. If I just hold that one. And then that would be 2v. What do you think half of v would be? Half of v. 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 Half
of V. Same direction, just half of it. So we say if you have a scalar times um, a vector, or k times u1, u2, it just becomes k u1 comma k u2. Which means I can give you a bunch of vectors and they can add and subtract and multiply, like the next example. Is that okay if I go? So if u is the vector with components 2, negative 1, and v is the vector 5, 3, find 3u plus v. No need to draw it. If you wanted to draw it, you could. But there's no need to because you should be able to just multiply 3 times u and then just add the first component, add the second component. So see if you can do that for a second while I mark all the actual statements. here. But we could say that 3u would equal 3 times 2, which is 6, uh, and 3 times negative 1 is negative 3. And so then uh, 3u plus v, we're just going to add those components together. 6 plus 5 is 11, negative 3 plus 3 
and negative 0.83. I like to leave it as square root because you can actually check that this now has a magnitude of 1. Because think about if you took this and you found the magnitude, you would get 4 over 13, because you square the top and you square the bottom, plus 9 over 13. And does that give you 13 over 13? Which is 1. So um, you kind of show that it really does work. But the answer would be writing it as a unit vector. So the multiplier of any one is? That's the definition of finding a unit vector. You want it to be a length of one. A unit vector means a vector that's going the same direction as this, but only has a length of one. So this one has a length of the square of 13. Oh, that's how you show it. Yeah, I would just like show it, proving. Which 
way uh, the, the arrow is pointed. When we're talking about direction, we're talking about the angle. Um, so how do you find the angle? That's where the trig comes in. And so they just gave you this formula up here, uh, but I just want to show you where this formula comes from. The same way, place that it's come from this whole time, if I have a point, so you leave us out here, I can draw this in. And this would be like the horizontal distance, which would be like D1, right? And this would be the vertical distance, which would be like D2. What could I say that cosine of theta would equal? V1 over V over the magnitude, right? Which again, the magnitude is just the square root of V1 squared plus V2 squared, which is why it's the Pythagorean theorem. And I could say the sine of theta is just d2 over the magnitude. Nothing's changed except for how we're labeling it. Right? Instead of ABC or XYR, we're talking about v1, d2, and the magnitude. So notice they're talking about um, the component form. If I wanted to solve this for v1, do you agree I would just multiply that absolute value of v over mm -hmm. magnitude of v over? And they say that V1 is equal to the magnitude of V times the cosine of theta. And that the second component, solving that for V2, if you multiply the magnitude over, you would get that the magnitude of V times sine equals V2. So that's where this formula is coming from. So if you ever forget it, you can just draw the picture and you can derive it yourself very easily. If this was the unit vector, what would the magnitude be? So if this was the unit vector, right, so this only works if it was a unit vector, kind of like unit circle stuff, we could say that the component form would just be cosine of theta, sine of theta. So they can give you the components and ask you to find the direction. If they're asking you to find the direction, they're asking you to find theta. Maybe they give you the direction and the magnitude, and they ask you just to write it in component form. Um, so let's do these last two examples here before the elements. Don't leave the room. I'm holding on. Okay. 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 They give me theta. They give me the magnitude, which is the absolute value of V. They ask me to write the component. I'm just plugging it in, right? It's knowing that it's V cosine of theta magnitude of V times the sine of theta. If it's a nice angle, like 120 degrees, probably you could give me nice answers, like something in a circle. If it was an ugly angle, like 70 degrees, then you'd have to just leave it at an angle or give me a decimal. Does that make sense? So I could say this is 8 cosine of 120 degrees, 8 sine of 120 degrees. Okay. 120 degrees is right there. Cosine is negative 1 half. Sine is radical 3 over 2. So putting that in component form, or finding the components, the first component is negative 4. The second component is 4 radical 3. Is there a that statement? Three, you can never do the one What if it's the other way? What if they gave me the components and they want me to find the magnitude of the direction? Magnitude is the easy part, right? Magnitude is the least. Magnitude would just be the square root of 2 squared plus 2 squared. I just walked squared. this down. Please let me stay on the wall. Stay on the office. Thank you, Lee. Let's just go ahead. Yes. Stay on the wood. Stay on the please. Cosine or sine, it doesn't matter which one you do. 
I'm just, I always use cosine because it's the one I think of first. Cosine is what? I just made Madeline Hammond treat the office, please. Barrett Freeman. Look on the previous Sarah slide. Lover, we wrote it out. The office. Brandy Thomas at the office. I wrote it out at least. I don't know if you wrote it out. But I want to solve for the theta now, right? Or if you wrote it like this, you could say u1 or v1, whatever, equals this, and you get this ratio. So you just plug those numbers in and say that would be 2 over the square root of 13. How do you solve for theta in that problem? Inverse cosine, because it's cosine, right? So same idea of what we've been doing, only talking about vectors here, all right? And, and we'll talk about that on your homework. Look in your book. There's great examples, all right? Read the examples, right? That's what I did yesterday when I did this homework. Here's your homework. I don't know if it's on there or not. I'll write it down. Six one day ones, 30 through 36 multiples of three. Tomorrow, 